Let me introduce Father Tom Massaro. He is the new dean of the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara. For those of you that didn't know, the locale of the institution sponsoring the West Coast School of Theology is now Santa Clara, although the classes are still taught at Berkeley. He taught before that time his moral theology for 15 years at Boston School of Theology and Ministry. Father Massaro holds a doctorate in Christian social ethics from Emory University. In addition to his regular column in America magazines, he has published dozens of articles and book reviews in scholarly journals as well as more popular venues. Among the seven books he has produced, two are volumes offering an ethical evaluation of American social welfare policies, as well as three editions of a popular classroom text, Living Justice, Catholic Social Teaching in America. And with Thomas Shannon, he co-authored Catholic Perspectives on War, Peace and War, and co-edited American Catholic Social Teaching. This guy is prolific. <laughs> Father Massaro's teaching and research include Catholic Social Ethics, theories of economic justice, sociology of religion, and the history of Christian political thoughts. Besides teaching courses on many aspects of Catholic social teaching and the role of religion in public life. Our most recent self-evaluation presented to the North Central uh, Committee proclaims the following. At the heart of Creighton University, is a community rooted in a mission that is animated by a faith that is both Catholic and inclusive. Creighton is a place where the gospel is in dialogue with culture, where faith meets reason. We are privileged today to extend that mission of the university in this conference celebrating the Constitution and the liturgy and to have such outstanding speakers to help us in our reflection on faith and culture. So, Father Thomas, welcome. Many thanks to Father Hauser for that generous introduction. Many thanks to Eileen Burke Sullivan for organizing such a splendidly conceived and, as far as I can tell, extremely well-organized conference here. Uh, for an appropriate uh, event for Vatican II's commemoration. I'm always pleased to come to Creighton where I have many friends, many uh, uh, colleagues here. Uh, this is, I've come here several times, this is my second time this calendar year. My friends back home in Berkeley think I'm secretly launching a, a, a campaign for mayor of Omaha. Uh, and if there's some of those Omaha stakes in the deal, I think I might actually do it. I'd rather be mayor of Omaha than Toronto at this point, I might add. Uh, as was mentioned, this December next month marks the 50th anniversary of the promulgation of the Second Vatican Council's Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium. It was approved on November 22nd of 1963 by a vote, I might add, a vote of 2162 to 46. That's a pretty rousing approval by the Council Fathers. It was promulgated on December 4th, and one of my earliest memories as a young boy, just a few years old, was the time of the actual enactment of, uh, of, of the Vatican II uh, um, liturgy document was Advent of 1964. And as a very young boy, I remember th this uh, event of all of a sudden, most of the mass was in English and eventually all of it was in the vernacular. And it really made an, uh, an impact on me. This document inaugurated a period of rapid liturgical change that thoroughly transformed public worship for Catholics around the world. Even given the way that the document builds upon decades of momentum in what was called the liturgical movement led by Virgil Michael and some others, this was a dramatic and seminal moment that richly deserves the attention that we're giving it this week and it deserves to be celebrated uh, very widely. Sacrosanctum Concilium contains lots of great sound bites, phrases that have become a, a key part of our Catholic idiom today. For example, already quoted just a moment ago, the idea that liturgy is the source and summit, sometimes translated summit and fount, culmen et fons, of the life of the church. 
Even more telling is a quote from the 14th paragraph of, of Sacrosanctum Concilium, which calls for the full, conscious, and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the liturgy itself. This participation comes indeed from our right as baptized members of the church to participate fully in all aspects of the life of the church. This phrase, active participation, echoes through the document like a mantra of sorts. It, it's repeated 11 times, uh, and in fact, 16 times, the phrase participation uh, overall in the document is mentioned. So we'll return to that idea of participation in the life of the church. Before I get ahead of myself, however, allow me to step back for a moment and to reflect on my particular task today in the, in the context of this conference and to mention a word or two about my methodology. Recall from Father Hauser's introduction, I am a social ethicist, I am not a liturgical theologian. We'll be hearing from some of those later on. Um, I take most seriously, or what occupies most of my time, is the social justice dimension of that phrase, the faith that does justice. So I'll be speaking as a social ethicist. Now, if you hear that a social ethicist is coming to a conference or a lecture series on liturgy, you think of him or her as maybe kind of like the, um, the after, after dinner, after dessert mint or something like that. Um, I would have expected to be uh, the last speaker to add just a little bit of patina of social justice onto what is deservedly so, a uh, focus on uh, the, the liturgical life of the church. I find myself uh, not unhappily, but oddly, as the leadoff hitter, to use a baseball analogy. I'm still thinking about the World Series. Um, but actually, I find this quite serendipitous. I'm very happy to share, again, from a social justice, a social ethics, a Catholic social teaching perspective that I represent at this conference, some insights into how the liturgical life of the church, Sacrosanctum Concilium's great uh, contribution to that, overlaps, involves, directly and indirectly touches upon the social justice dimension. One of my great heroes in this area, and, and a personal friend of mine from my days at Emory University uh, studying with him, is Don Salliers. Um, in a very seminal 1979 article in the Journal of Religious Ethics, often reprinted, Don Salliers had this to say about liturgy and ethics. There has to date been a paucity of dialogue between liturgical studies and ethics. I might add, this remains true 30 or so years later. Don Salliers continues, even though it seems obvious that there are significant links between liturgical life, the confession of faith, and the concrete works that flow from those. Several places later in that seminal article, Don Salliers refers to what he posits as the key link, the elements that link liturgy and ethics together. Among them are desires, emotions, attitudes, beliefs, and actions. He says later, how we worship and pray is linked to how we live. Is there anything that could be truer? He says, the relations between liturgy and ethics are most adequately formulated by specifying how certain affections and virtues are formed and expressed in the modalities of communal prayer and ritual action. So I'm going to also focus a little bit on these connections between how we pray and how we act for social justice. After all, the double focus of a liturgy, as Salyers pointed out so long ago, is the glorification of God and the sanctification of men and women. And we sanctify ourselves through acts of liturgy and service, liturgia and diakonia, worship and the doing of good works. They must go together. And by the way, Don Salyers, a Methodist, is, can certainly make the point that both Catholics and Protestants, although with slightly different emphases on faith and works from, from times past, continue to have an overlap in these really important dimensions of linking uh, faith and justice, linking liturgy and social justice. I am certainly an enthusiast enthusiastic supporter of both social justice and liturgy. You do know that there are people who posit a split between the liturgical Catholics and the social justice Catholics. Nonsense. 
Anybody who says that doesn't really understand the inner dimensions, the inner workings, the inner dynamics of our faith. We, as a social justice advocate, really all my professional life, where would I get my energies for doing social justice, for, for exploring questions of, of, of justice in the world today, if not from liturgy, if not from the great energies of the Eucharist? And I could probably say the same uh, reflexively. How would somebody uh, do, uh, doing liturgy not see the connection? How would someone focusing on the beauties, the aesthetics of liturgy, not see the connection towards sending people out the doors of that church and into the world of social activism to, to bring greater solidarity to, to the world, our troubled world that we live in? Uh, in his recent book, and I have my copy here, I'm hoping he'll sign it by the end of this conference. In his recent book, True Reform, uh, my uh, colleague Massimo Fagioli uh, quotes another book by a, a, a Jesuit uh, who's a, a friend of mine named Keith Pecklers. Um, and Keith Pecklers' book, Worship, a Primer in Christian Ritual, includes this sentence. Social justice needs liturgy, and liturgy needs social justice. When you think of the aesthetics, the beautiful music, furnishings, ritual, words and, 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 and music that make our prayer, those aesthetics are not separated from the doing of justice, preparing people to, do, to enter into a life of social ethics, of caring for the poor. Remember the, the, the three transcendentals that the great philosophers from Socrates on talked about? The good, the true, and the beautiful. Well, certainly ethics is about the good, doing those things that are good, that are ethical. And liturgy is, for the most part, for, certainly the focus is on the beautiful. But I want to break down those distinctions. Right actions and, and good liturgy go together. And the ethical and the liturgical are of a piece. So the focus of my talk, as you could tell already, the style of my talk, is to unite things that are, pre I wouldn't say previously, but notionally, conceptually, sometimes, unfortunately, artificially separated. I'd like to overcome that kind of silo mentality that separates liturgy and ethics, that separates our Eucharistic uh, worship and our deeds of social justice. You've heard the old saying that people are either lumpers or splitters. Well, um, social ethicists are customarily splitters. We like to make sharp distinctions, uh, for example, between a charity and justice, between economic power and political power. Sometimes our goal is ultimately to resolve this tension. Jacques Maritain's a good example. He always introduced distinctions. He divided in order ultimately to unite a good social ethicist. Well, that's often my style. Uh, what I want to do today is primarily to integrate the aspects of our lives that are on the table today. Liturgy, the life of prayer, the life of communal worship, and the ethical life. To do so is a certainly worthwhile aspiration, and it needs to be done because there are people who don't see these connections, and it doesn't fit their agenda uh, to make these connections explicit. And I might just add from the Jesuit perspective, this very much fits the Jesuit agenda of resolving the false split between prayer and action. You know the Jesuit phrase, contemplation in action. It's possible to do both. It's possible to unite the two, to integrate the two, and there's good reason to do so. The most recent general congregation of the Society of Jesus, GC 35, about six years ago, employs some rousing phrases in the, uh, regarding this insight, expressing the ap aspiration to trace the footprints of God everywhere, to feel and to taste the presence and activity of God in all persons and circumstances of the world. And this idea of uniting our worship, our contemplation, and our action for social justice comes up frequently in just about any conversation in Jesuit or Ignatian circles about spirituality and mission and how they coincide. So again, the goal is an authentic Christian life in all of its aspects which are united together in prayer, in liturgy, in our political and economic behavior, and in work for social justice, the social ministry of the church. The motif, of course, is that we are all one in Christ and all aspects of our lives and faith are reconciled precisely in Christ who brings us together. Our sharing of a banquet experience, 
around a table of the, of the holy altar, and our actions for justice must coincide. After all, liturgy is about our relationship with God, and social justice is about our relationship with God. We need to be able to link our love of God and our love of neighbor, which are an integrated whole of one piece. We should never be surprised when liturgy and social justice are woven together, how they overlap each other, and especially how they feed each other. And just to cast a little wider net uh, at the outset, any time we gather around a table, any act of eating, uh, not necessarily in a church, any meal, is an event that involves social justice, solidarity with those who, who have no food, for example. Any time that we consider consuming food and drink, uh, it really is, uh, well, you've seen the bumper sticker, eating is a moral act. Do you have bumper stickers here in Omaha, Nebraska? Uh, my, the last 20 or so years of my life have been spent in the cities of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Berkeley, California, which I consider the bumper sticker capitals of the world. And I often do see that. Eating is a moral act. And that includes the, the ritual eating, uh, the sacred uh, meal of the Eucharist, but any time that we consume food. It reminds us of those who do not have as much food, and it reminds us of, um, of our obligation to make uh, food available and to share in a significant, in a meaningful way with those who do not. One of the books that has inspired me over the years, uh, Monica K. Helwig's book, The Eucharist and the Hunger of the World, small book, uh, wonderful thoughts from that late scholar at Georgetown University, former president of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities, Monica Helwig. She's only one of many great scholars who have worked on this topic. Um, for example, the Benedictine leader of the liturgical movement, Virgil Michael, uh, Don Saliers, whom I've already mentioned, uh, people like Mark Searle, my Jesuit uh, forebears, Walter Burkhardt and John Donahue, uh, my contemporaries, uh, Daniel Grudy and Bruce Morrill. These are all scholars who have worked on the linkage between social justice and the liturgy, and specifically the Eucharist. Um, how do these scholars connect liturgical acts and social justice? I'm going to characterize them with the phrase, an indirect route. They link liturgy and social justice through kind of complicated concepts, and I'll cover them briefly. What would a direct route be? A direct route would be to say, oh, well, we link liturgy and social justice by having theme liturgies, and we're going to sponsor a, a Sunday or a week of liturgies or, an, or a novena or an octave of masses that is all about social justice. This, seems, this strikes me as somewhat artificial. It's like, you know, having to emphasize something, you're almost trying too hard uh, to make almost like it's propositional statements that we expect people to assent to, to adhere to, as if, as if social justice is a freestanding item uh, that has no deeper connection uh, to the liturgy. No, social justice can never be seen as disjointed from liturgical life. It is deeply embedded, our care for others, our concern for um, the needs of others and solidarity, especially with the poor, is deeply embedded in the totality of liturgical acts themselves. Uh, one of my former students is Chris Vogt, Christopher Vogt, who's now an ethicist at St. John's University in that great borough of Queens, New York. If you can't tell from my accent, that's exactly where I come from. And uh, before he took that job at, at uh, St. John's, uh, Chris Vogt studied with me at Boston College, and he, he made in a recent essay this simple state statement, but it needs to be said. Liturgy is not an ethics class. You don't come to a church on Sunday or any other day or any act of communal worship in order to be lectured at regarding social justice, uh, ethics, whether personal or social ethics. Um, liturgy is formation. Liturgy is not merely information. At liturgy, we are transformed in what I would describe as a holistic sense, not by receiving some new data, some new propositional statements that we're asked to consent to, but rather by subjecting ourselves to being shaped and molded, changed into a better person. I like that Latin phrase, esse melior, which is a Latin phrase associated with sacramental efficacy in general, but especially in the Eucharist, and especially when people of faith who care about a faith that does justice gather to celebrate the Eucharist in an appropriate way. 
This insight was also conveyed by some language by two popes long ago and far away. Let me mention what they said. In 1903, Pope Pius X promulgated a motu proprio. It's the instruction on sacred music called Tra Le Solicitudini. And in that instruction on sacred music, Pius X said, liturgy is the primary and indispensable source of the true Christian spirit. The source of the true Christian spirit is liturgy. A generation later, Pius XI, in a social encyclical called Quattrogesimo Anno, 1931, said a similar thing. The true Christian spirit is necessary for social regeneration. That's his way of saying social justice. So we have two popes about a century ago talking about the true Christian spirit and linking it to aspects of liturgy, especially music in the case of Pius X. And this is a very promising focus. The, what is the true Christian spirit? How do we experience it in liturgy? How does it, how does it move us to actions for social justice? I'm also reminded in this uh, vein, in this regard, of something that Karl Rahner said about 15 years after Vatican II, in his final years, when he was asked to say something about the documents of Vatican II. And he, he made a sweeping statement, but one that needs to be made. Karl Rahner said, the documents of Vatican II are not a mere arbitrary accumulation of decisions and actions and ideas, but there is an inner essential connection among all the things that the fathers of Vatican II said and did. An inner essential connection among all those things. Now, the dirty little secret here about this whole conference is, or at least my part of it is, nowhere in Sacrosanctum Concilium, the decree on the, uh, the Constitution on Liturgy, does the phrase social justice appear. So it seems like we're grasping at straws. That's why I'm taking an indirect route. I might add, Gaudium et Spes, Vatican II's primary social justice document, it's the Constitution on the Church and the Modern World, nowhere talks about liturgy. There's no discussion of the Eucharist or any of the wonderful themes that we're about to discuss in this conference. So we need to make those linkages ourselves. The documents themselves, on the literal level, explicitly, do not make a liturgy and justice connection. The social justice document doesn't mention liturgy. The liturgy document doesn't mention social justice. Therefore, we need to dig a little deeper, but it's not hard to do if you're sensitive to what's really happening in these documents, as Karl Rahner and many others have said. And, and let me preface my treatment of some themes by saying simply this. If you expect a direct approach to linking liturgy and justice, uh, you'll be disappointed on, on two counts. The first is what I just said. The documents themselves do not give us a reason to do that. In fact, until you get to much later documents from the 1970s, especially Justice in the World, that's a, a social teaching document from the Synod of Bishops in 1971, there you have a little bit of linkage in a Vatican document of liturgy and social justice. Actually, Justice in the World primarily links uh, social justice to education for justice, but there are some parts of liturgy, including the sacrament of reconciliation, a confession. But my wager is that the Eucharist does proclaim social justice, even if the documents from Vatican II don't, don't do that explicitly, that liturgy is a resource for justice, and justice is a res resource for liturgy as well, a holistic understanding of what the church is up to in the things that it does. And secondly, you would be disappointed if you expected um, People's experience of liturgy, on the tips of their tongues, if you ask people, describe your experience of liturgical celebrations. How does social justice Im impact that or come into play? I do this to my students all the time. I teach courses in social justice that includes sessions on preaching justice and liturgical enactments of justice. Most people, most of the time, will draw a blank, even if they show up at liturgies all the time, around the clock. Um, most places, I suspect a college campus, a university campus like St. John's uh, Parish here on this campus, would be the exception. But in most parishes, and most dioceses, most of the time, it's rare that people can recall an explicit treatment of social justice in a liturgy, a theme just doesn't come to the surface that often. And in a sense, that's not so surprising. 
And the reason it's not so surprising is what I have been talking about. The implicit dimensions of liturgy that speak to us of social justice, that, that prepare us, that form us, that transform us to be people of social justice. So keep these points in the background. Massimo Fagioli, if his uh, lecture uh, later in this conference reflects some of the things that he says in his book, True Reform, just from last year, uh, where he talks about the liturgy and the ecclesiology that come out of Vatican II documents, like Sacrosanctum Concilium. I suspect he will treat this uh, at great length. When Massimo talks about these things, he makes uh, just one claim and one phrase that I'll put before you before moving on, and they're both excellent. The, f the claim that he makes, and it's on page 153 of his book, is that Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Vatican II document on the liturgy, is at the crossroads of the entire corpus of Vatican II. Now, one of the reasons for that is it's one of the first documents promulgated in the first session of Vatican II. It's at the crossroads. Other documents, there were over a dozen major documents, decrees and constitutions from Vatican II. They pick up on trends that, that Sacrosanctum Concilium was at the front of the queue, as the British would say. And the phrase I would like to call to your attention is mentioned on page 149 of Massimo Fagioli's book, True Reform. And he refers to the intertextual connections with other documents of Vatican II. So if, as you read through the corpus of Vatican II, you all have that thick uh, book of Vatican II documents, you will see what Massimo Fagioli calls intertextual connections with the, with the uh, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. The wonderful point that is being made here with these phrases is that Sacrosanctum Concilium in its influence, in its uh, focus, was not limited solely to liturgical reform. It set the stage, it set the agenda for many other reforms, especially through our consideration of ecclesiology, of the meaning, the functions, the structures of the church and its insights were incorporated into such Vatican II documents as Lumen Gentium on the church and Gaudium et Spes on the church in the modern world. I would say that Vatican II, to my eyes, has a deep internal coherence. Themes that come up in some documents are reflected in others. The great church historian, my Jesuit colleague John O'Malley, asserts in his writings, his many writings now on Vatican II, that there was a certain way of looking at the world, a distinctive hermeneutics, I dare even to say uh, with John O'Malley, a style that is distinctive to Vatican II that had showed up in no previous ecumenical council of the church. There was an atmosphere of openness, and this openness showed forth in the debate on liturgy in the early months of the, of the council, and of course, uh, which got the whole ball rolling for the other documents and certainly is reflected in the texts of Sacrosanctum Concilium. I could easily list uh, probably a dozen themes that come out of Sacrosanctum Concilium that are relevant to social justice, but let me underline just three leitmotifs that Vatican II gave us uh, that, again, touch liturgy and justice uh, and bridge the two together. The first one is that theme, and we all know about these phrases, these two foreign words that have kind of come into English, they, they now go through spell check, resourcement and aggiornamento, uh, which in Sacrosanctum Concilium, paragraph 23, aggiornamento is, uh, is, is called in a circumlocution, the, the, uh, the connotation is legitimate progress, the concept of change, which builds on sources, resourcement, but is, is a new openness uh, that puts the liturgy uh, in a new light, and I'm going to emphasize for the next minute or two, the way that liturgy, the worship that, that Christians do, is now set in a new way on a public stage and with even potentially political connotations. What do I mean by this? Massimo Fagioli, on page 98 of that book, True Reform, is wise to call attention to the ways in which an early paragraph of Sacrosanctum Concilium functions as a springboard to consider, and here's the phrase from, from Massimo Fagioli, the public political character of the liturgy. 
It calls the church to be a sign lifted up among the nations, thus raising a, an abundance of political public meanings associated with various items in the agenda of later council documents, especially the documents on ecumenism, on religious liberty, dignitatis humanae, on freedom of conscience, and on social ethics, Gaudium et Spes. There's a public dimension, reading the signs of the times in our current world, uh, wherever they may lead us in ministry, in social ministries, in service to the wider world. The church at Vatican II was being mobilized in a new and distinctive way, open to reform, oriented for outreach in a renewed way to the wider world, whether Catholic, Protestant, members of any religion, or none at all. This is a new direction of Vatican II. There could no longer be a ghetto Catholicism. There could no longer be a church that hid behind its walls. It was a church that emphasized the sending, the going out, agentes, the mission on the, the decree on, on missions is another example of that. I've been describing this Vatican II theme of aggiornamento. One of the novel aspects of this is a provision for reliance on bishops' conferences. I think of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. There's a very strong one in Brazil. There's a strong one in the Philippines. Various European groupings of bishops on a national or regional level. This also was another aspect, another outgrowth of Sacrosanctum Concilium, which actually missioned those bishops' conferences to adopt the liturgy to your circumstances. Certainly true with the, in the case of adopting it to the vernacular language of your area or region. Why is this significant? Because it shows that even in that first document of Vatican II to be published, 1963, there was a focus on the spiritual needs of the faithful and an eagerness to meet and to address the wider connections, the social dimensions of Catholic life, reaching out to other uh, groups in our society, into the larger pluralistic society. And in uh, speaking as a social ethicist, this had the greatest of importance of implications for social justice, for advocating for proper social order and enacting those commitments. That's the first thing. The second theme I want to pull, uh, pull out is the theme of the participation of the laity, which obviously imbued several later documents of Vatican II, most notably Apostolicum Actuositatem, the decree on the laity, on the apostolate of the laity. Paragraph 50 of Sacrosanctum Concilium cites the importance of devout and active participation of the faithful. This calls attention to the necessity to acknowledge and to defend the liturgical dignity of all the faithful, not just priests and clerics. This bundle of concepts is wrapped up with a very distinctive ecclesiology, understanding of the church that grew out of Vatican II, and it certainly embraces that familiar image of the church as the people of God. To put a finer point on what seems obvious to me, the linkage of liturgy and ethics, social ethicists are always keenly concerned, we're highly interested in extending the full conscious and active participation of all people in political life, in economic life, in social institutions, the entirety of life. This is the meaning of social justice, inviting all people to take their active role in society which they are entitled to by the notion of human rights, especially political life, the universal uh, uh, suffrage, voting, the, the enfranchisement of all people. No one should be excluded from this. That's a very parallel set of concerns to full active conscious participation in the liturgy. The same goes to society. So that's the second theme of the three, participation of the laity and of all people, active participation both in liturgy and in social life. No one to be excluded. And the third theme, probably the most obvious of all, when considering the Eucharist and social justice, is the theme of solidarity. Of, and I would add the, the virtue of hospitality that goes with solidarity. It's about care for others. It's deeply rooted in the scriptures. Think of Old Testament stories, Abraham showing hospitality to, to sojourners who turned out to be angels. Think of all the, the parables of Jesus that just kept giving us the message, whether the Good Samaritan or the Final Judgment, 
kept giving us the message that we are all one, that the human family is, is united, and the needs of any impose an obligation on each one of us. I'd like to pick up one thread, though, of something that Jesus uh, said and did in the Gospels, and that's the, the wonderful feeding stories, the feeding of 4,000 and 5,000. Look up your Matthew chapter 14. Look up your Mark chapter 8, the beginning of chapter 8. The, the stories of the multiplication of loaves are often called, although I prefer the, the idea of the feeding of the 4,000 or the 5,000. It says a bit more. Now, there are various creative interpretations of these stories uh, that have come out in preaching that I've heard uh, in recent years. The idea, what was the agency of Jesus in these stories? Well, it wasn't simply to, to bless some loaves and to, to pull off a pretty good miracle that a good magician would be able to do, multiplying something. Rather, the interpretation that I've become quite enamored of recently is that by sharing the little bit that he had at his disposal within arm's reach, Jesus inspired, invited others who perhaps had some extra food under their tunics or so to share their hidden supplies, and he modeled for them, he inspired them to carry out spontaneously what he had done. The multitude, 4,000 or 5,000 is a lot of people, the multitude is moved by a liturgy, agency of Jesus, a liturgy of sorts, to care for one another, to feed one another, to reach into their surplus. This develops a new kind of agency that should have implications, lessons, for all of us to imitate. It's a charitable gesture, but it's more than that. It's also a social justice gesture. gesture. Use our resources, use our surplus to benefit others. It's really an entire disposition to a new way of life that's very much at variance with the market culture, the capitalist society that we live in. Sharing goods out of a sense of moral duty, a new sense of solidarity, a new sense of, of agency. John Paul II used phrases like this frequently. He reintroduced the word solidarity into Catholic social thought. Remember in his 1987 encyclical, Solicitudo Re Socialis, he defines solidarity as not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of so many people. Rather, solidarity is a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. That is to say, the good of all and of each individual, because we really are all responsible for all." End of quotation. I especially appreciate moments in the liturgy when solidarity comes out the strongest. Think of the prayers of the faithful, our intercessions. Let us pray to the Lord. They reflect a broader, at least an opportunity, for broader social concern and solidarity. Praying for the intentions and the well-being of people who are far away, who are not like us, whom we barely know, we barely even heard about them, whether a natural disasters or political turmoil, civil strife have racked their land. I'm praying every day for the people of Syria, for example. I suspect all of us are. Um, those are acts of solidarity, picking up new objects of our concern out of a sense for fellow feeling. That grows out of the overall liturgical action. And think about it. The prayers of the faithful come just before the offertory, another moment of solidarity where we have an opportunity to collect some resources in the collection and to bring forward simple gifts of bread and wine that ideally come from the people and, and to direct our resources at that moment of the liturgy. And I'll, I'll mention some other moments, privileged moments of the liturgy that call up solidarity. But when our offertory collection serves groups like uh, agencies like Catholic Relief Service, Catholic Charities, the Ca Catholic Campaign for Human Development, even those special collections, are another moment when we are doing maybe consciously what is probably unconscious and implicit in the overall movement of the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. I want to talk about uh, an acquaintance of mine, and I'm awfully impressed by her book, Sister Margaret Scott. Have you ever heard of Sister Margaret Scott? Several years ago, uh, five years ago, she published a book called The Eucharist and Social Justice. Margaret is a member of the religious order called the Handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And she describes in this book, which comes from Paula's Press, just a, a series of stunning 
testimonies, narratives of her experiences with the poor, and she's worked in a half dozen countries, her experiences of outcast people around the world. And the book really isn't an academic treatment as much as a narrative account of the way that her life has built more and more towards linking the Eucharist and social justice. And she presses the point, and I'm quoting here, that my passion for knowing and serving the poor accompanies, informs, and deepens my own passion for the Eucharist. Let me repeat that. Her work for the poor informs and deepens her Eucharistic devotion. This is very eloquent testimony to how solidarity spans both our ritual actions and our outreach, our actions for social justice, our advocacy, as well as our direct service by means of charitable uh, agencies. If we are truly in meaningful communion with them, then we should care about the material needs and hungers of all people. No book makes that point clearer than Monica Helwig's book, The Eucharist and the Hunger of the World. If there is anyone hungry, as we gather around our tables of plenty in our, in our daily meals and the table of God's promise and the table of the covenant in the Eucharist, our sacred altar, our sacred table, how could we possibly not be affected by this? And so there are visible effects of our shared prayer and worship, at least ideally so, in creating greater bonds of community, growing outward ripples of concern, like, like ripples of water on a pond, mutual concern for people around the world, that our common prayer and ritual must have direct effects in our lives, in our service of others. It directs our understanding of where we came from, our common creation, all people coming from the same loving God, where we are now in a troubled world where there probably is enough food to go around, but do we distribute it correctly? And thirdly and finally, sharing where we are going as well, our ultimate destiny, the eternal banquet of God's kingdom, the, the messianic banquet that we are called to share. In each of these moments, we, um, we reach out consciously to other people. And if we don't, we're not experiencing the fullness of faith, certainly not the fullness of the Eucharist. I want to put in a word here for the word urgency, a special appeal to keep ever before our eyes the urgent needs of the poor. This is a world where 50,000 children a day starve or die of preventable diseases. And we have the resources, we have the power to change those things, and so often we choose not to use our power to make changes in the world. If you're not feeling a sense of urgency, maybe we're not experiencing the Eucharist as well as we should. It's not just spiritual hunger, it's the physical hunger needs of our neighbors around the world that we are called to respond to. Hunger and suffering is against the will of God, who has supplied us so much. The Eucharist points us towards an alternative lifestyle, a lifestyle that's countercultural, that is a counter-narrative. It's not at all in conformity with our current cult market culture of mass consumption, consumerism. The Eucharist calls back, calls us to the dangerous memory, that subversive memory of Jesus Christ, his suffering and death, because he ran up against the powers that be, the Jewish and Roman authorities of his time. And the challenge that he had to gather in a social egalitarianism which is at the heart of Jesus' life and certainly around the Lord's Supper. Read 1 Corinthians 11, St. Paul's take on this. And it's scandalous that Jesus shared table fellowship with sinners and those who were outcasts, and he challenged the very meaning of what it means to sit at a table, which is so often a place of humiliation for those who do not have a place of honor. And those subversive memories of a countercultural Jesus inspire us as we sit around the the sacred table of the altar. It reverses so many of the things. It redraws the maps of our society. It stretches our social imaginations to include those who are different from us, those who are in need. It disturbs our complacency. Uh, it challenges our boundaries. And I keep coming back to words that have a trans uh, 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 affix before them, prefix, 
transubstantiation, the, the elements of the Eucharist, but that calls for us to undergo personal transformation and social transformation and the various kinds of conversion. All of these are linked, and we would be cutting off the, the full meaning of the Eucharist not to see these linkages. How do we integrate liturgy and social justice? Now, I, I, as soon as I utter that phrase, integrating liturgy and social justice, I draw back a little bit because it sounds like I'm trying too hard. If you have to try that hard to do it literally, it seems too much like an effort where it should flow naturally. It should be something that you, just, you don't force to happen, that you see in your liturgical actions, not some add-on, not some special message for this week, but something that grows organically out of the ritual. And uh, again, if you have to work so hard to make it happen, maybe you're not doing it quite the right way. Monica Helwig famously said, uh, I think it's in this book actually, Eucharist and the Hunger of the World, instead of expecting to grasp the Eucharist intellectually, the Eucharist has a way of grasping us. And I hope that your experience of the liturgy gives you a chance for that to happen. Now, the complicated thing is that the Eucharist is not a univocal, simple thing. It grasps us. But when Jesus says, do this in memory of me, that is not a simple command. Why? Because the Eucharist is such a multivalent thing. It has so many meanings. It's a meal. It's a sacrifice. It's a healing ritual. It's the memorial of an event, the Last Supper, and the memorial of a person, Jesus himself. It's the renewal of our covenant with God. It's an act of worship and praise. It's the celebration of mercy and forgiveness of a compassionate God. It's a celebration of the real presence of Christ. It's a thanksgiving. That's the root meaning of the word eucharisteia from Greek. It's such a, a multi-layered thing that it's hard to say this is what it is. But we shouldn't reduce the Eucharist to any one thing. And I'm not adv advocating that it's a sound bite or a public service announcement for social justice. Uh, remember what Chris Vogt said, it's not an ethics class when we go to mass. One obvious fact, though, is that we gather for liturgy. We assemble. We would look pretty silly doing it all alone, although there are people who do that, but not me. Uh, there's a communal dimension to every act of liturgical worship, and especially the Eucharist. We forge a shared identity when we gather around that table. Fidelity to the sacrament means fidelity to our social commitments as well. How are these communicated? Let me quote, let me quote, quote three sources very briefly. How is this fidelity to social commitments communicated in the liturgy? How is it transmitted? My good friend, the Franciscan friar Ken Himes, in a 1998 article in the journal Worship, gives us a clue. He says, the Eucharist enables the individual to act upon moral commitments. It enables the individual to pursue the cause of justice. And this requires, as Himes points out in that article, a visceral, not just a cerebral commitment. There's something bodily about that, a real commitment of our bodies, of our hands, our hearts, as well as our head. I'll quote, uh, secondly, my friend Chris Vogt one more time, who says, participating in the liturgy deepens a person's understanding of what is right. It deepens our understanding of what is right. He goes on to say, few Christians read theological texts or pastoral letters from bishops. The place where Christians meet the church, its people and its teaching, is at worship. That's the front lines, the parish church, any given Sunday. And our liturgy must reflect that solidarity and the other qualities that we've been talking about. And the third soundbite I'll quote here, Don Salier's once again, liturgy is a characterizing event, a characterizing event. It gives us character. It's an event that gives shape to us, our fundamental orientation and location in the world. I'll summarize all three of those by saying this. Liturgy lays the foundation for shared social concerns. Participation in the liturgy doesn't just send out intellectual messages about equality and solidarity. Liturgy enacts those meanings as we break bread and share it, which suggests something about breaking other breads, other resources open and sharing. 
the rich and the poor, the kings and beggars gather around the same table, share a meal, and that's got to have social implications. The liturgy of the word, where we hear God's fidelity throughout history, God's own option for the poor, leads into the liturgy of the Eucharist around the table, where we enact that with bread and wine, a blessing, breaking, and sharing thereof. Um, I love the idea that sometimes our liturgies make reference to the communion of saints, part of our, our creed, and we do say the creed on Sundays at, in our masses, and Virgil Michael was very firm on this. From our creed comes our enactment, and the place of liturgy, the place of worship, the moment of communal worship is when that happens. So to summarize, my thesis in general is that although the decree on the liturgy did not the Constitution on the Liturgy did not literally address these aspects of social justice. We can't find that word there. The decree on the Liturgy does leave us a legacy, the legacy of Vatican II, to give us a new, perhaps renewed, sense, sensitivity to justice in our liturgical life. It represented a turn to wholeness, a return to an awareness. And just to shift in my final moments here, to shift a little bit the tone of what I've said, I'm going to turn it to the minor key for a few seconds here. Just as all theology after World War II occurs in the shadow of Auschwitz, so all of our liturgical theology, I would say all theology, since 1994 occurs, unfolds in the shadow of the Rwandan genocide of 1994. 100,000 or more people were killed. How could Christians slaughter Christians in such a wide scale in one of the most Christian countries in all of Africa, really in all of the world, the most Catholic countries? 47% of Rwanda's people were Catholic, and many of those were the, were the perpetrators of this horrible genocide. The conflict between how we worship and how we live was never clearer than when we, we look at that incident. People who went to church and probably prayed with each other one Sunday were hacking each other with machetes the next week. However, that's not the only, the high profile ones aren't the only injustices that we should consider. I'll do some self-confession here. Every Sunday uh, when I attend uh, masses and especially at the Newman Center in downtown Berkeley, there are homeless beggars outside the church. And by the way, they're very smart, they know it makes sense to wait outside a church. That's a good place to get a donation. People have been formed in that previous hour. But how often do we, I'll speak for myself, how often do I pause, take out the wallet, and make a donation to that person, despite all that I've been through? I'm callous. We're all callous. There's always going to be a tension between how we worship and how we live, as long as we are sinful beings. And that seems to be perduring pretty well. Even the Pope admitted uh, recently, I am a sinner. Our consciousness of our sin should be one more thing that moves us to action to overcome that. Liturgy does not inoculate us against um, callousness. It's not an antidote against all of the kinds of structural sins that are kind of built into the way that we relate to people economically, politically, socially, culturally. But worship does have the power, if we allow it, to form humans for works of love. I'll quote Don Salyers one more time. There is an internal conceptual link between liturgy and ethics. How we pray and worship is indeed linked to how we live. Or it, it is linked, and it should be linked even more deeply. Our identity and our actions, shaped by the narratives that we hear, shaped by the rituals that we enact. In my final moment or two, let me uh, ask the question, what about the future? of liturgy and social justice. I only have a very modest agenda here. I don't really have that many ideas. Maybe I'll leave that to my subsequent speakers in this wonderful conference. Um, uh, John Baldwin, especially with his book, Reforming the Liturgy, A Response to the Critics, a 2008 title, uh, gives, us, he, gives us a good guide to the reform of the liturgy. And maybe there are some trajectories that other speakers, John and others, can speak about from their own perspective. Well, let me just make three brief recommendations. One is. If it's true that participation in the liturgy contributes to social justice, this can only happen if our liturgies are enlivening, not if they're deadening and boring. <laughs> um, 
Liturgy, as Martin Luther said, as uh, Cyril of Jerusalem said long ago, liturgy is a school for seeing. And people only see things, like the need for solidarity, if they are energized, if they are stimulated by excellent music, careful preparation of the liturgy. So a, a frankly boring liturgy cannot do the wonderful things that we ask it to do. There's got to be creativity, freshness, even boldness, uh, a link of the continuity of great traditional elements with some new creative ones. That's what I look for. And that's really the excellence in aesthetics that uh, all are calling for. A second uh, trajectory for the future is that liturgy um, uh, should have a communal dimension that is apparent. People need, for example, to sit closer together. I like when we uh, ask people to sit towards the front of our conference. Think of it, the last time you were in a liturgy where people, nobody sat within an arm's length of each other, right? We create our own little boxes. I want to be alone with Jesus for this moment. Maybe I'm tolling my rosary beads. Uh, I've experienced liturgies in certain parishes and certain cities I've lived in, they will go unmentioned, where at the, kiss, at the sign of peace, nobody could reach anybody else. It was like they were in that, what's that called, the physics, the maximum entropy, the maximum dispersion of particles in a chamber. Well, if you can't hold somebody's hand, if you're not close enough to do that, I doubt that you're going to feel the solidarity that I've been talking about and that liturgy calls us to. It's the moment in the day or the week when we should overcome our individualism and our privatistic behavior. Enough said about that. The corporate identity of the assembly is a really uh, important thing, and it's an antidote, potential antidote, to modern individualism. And my third and final uh, trajectory for the future is simply to say we need to continue to enhance that Vatican II theme of the empowerment of the laity, of all people having an active, conscious participation in the liturgy, uh, building lay agency in the church, new models for what it means for everyone, not just ordained uh, priests and deacons, to exert leadership in the church. I believe that our current Pope, Pope Francis, is very serious about lay leadership uh, in positions as high as cardinal. I think that's come into the press in recent days. I'd love to see the first female cardinal. Um, liturgical leadership must grow, must expand to include all lay people, and I hope that subsequent speakers in this conference will address that, those issues, which are crucial to the trajectory of Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is really what I have been trying to lay out from my own social justice scholarship perspective today. So to return to the Vatican II document, Sacrosanctum Concilium, for one last paragraph or so. I have already mentioned that this document contains no explicit treatment of social justice per se. We have to do a little bit of reading between the lines. But the range of topics, some of which I've talked about, others which remain, um, is um, at the distance of 50 years, I would say more important than ever before. Sacrosanctum Concilium treats a whole line of issues that seem kind of quaint uh, at, at the distance of 50 years now, addressing things like um, how often it's appropriate to have received communion under both species. It was rare back in 1963 or so. The possibility of con celebration, reviving that tradition, liturgical colors, changes in the Psalter and the divine office and liturgical calendar, uh, the, the, the quaint opinion, and I'm going to quoting here, that the pipe organ is to be held in high esteem among the, uh, it's kind of, there must have been a pet peeve by somebody in the, uh, in the crowd because there's another rant against overly mo monumental and pretentious statues and furnishings in church and uh, other complaints about the music that was heard during that time. There are truly hidden gems in this document. For example, uh, the reminder to, citing 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. And uh, just shortly after that in the document, citing John 15.5, without me, you can do nothing. Pray without ceasing. Without me, you can do nothing. The energies that were unleashed by that Vatican II Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy gave us great momentum, I can say as a moral theologian, for our moral life orienting us in a most commendable way. The sacred liturgy and the overall activity of the church that was treated in this document 
gave great momentum to works for social justice, to the task of forming people through liturgy and Christian education for works of social justice and activism for the poor of our world. Eucharist, after all, is a foretaste of God's kingdom. It's a, it's a uh, fulfillment of justice that we experience ultimately only in the messianic banquet. But until then, meeting the hunger of the world, meeting the needs of our troubled world for true justice through our liturgy really does point the way forward to a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, very much. And I'd like to ask now Dr. Jill O'Brien, uh, the newest member of our theology department and a social ethicist as well, and uh, for, for uh, truth in uh, advertising here, a student of Father Massaro's, a uh, recent student. So Jill is going to give a few moments of reflection on what she heard, and then we'll be inviting all of you to engage some questions and comments with Tom. I'm a little short. Can everyone hear me? All right. Um, thank you to Father Massaro for a wonderful talk, as always, as I'm accustomed to, luckily enough. I will be brief. Um, Father Massaro has just done a masterful job of reading between the lines, as he put it, of Sacrosanctum Concilium to give us a sense of how connections to social justice are actually embedded within the liturgy and especially within the Eucharist. Acknowledges that the document does not make an explicit link between liturgy and social justice, but he finds hints and glimmers of this link in the emphases we do see in this writing from Vatican II. He also shares his own insights on how the connection can be, be made without an unrealistic stretch. If we just look a little bit more closely at this ritual that's so familiar to us and yet so mysterious at the same time. He does this, for example, by his visual observations of people's behavior toward the end there, toward people's behavior during the liturgy itself, uh, and implies that this behavior may mirror our relationship to each other out there in the world. So he quotes uh, Don Salyer's line that, how we worship and pray is linked to how we live. It's a good line. And he reminds us that worshiping and praying together as one body is an important aspect of a communal ethics that we learn in an indirect way. And this indirect way could, I think, maybe be described as through the heart, uh, in contrast to the direct route, through the usual cerebral path of reason. Uh, Father Massaro emphasizes the importance of closeness during the liturgy, lamenting the sort of Robert Putnam-esque bowling alone insistence on maximum personal space that you find like in an elevator, for example. So maybe this is one instance where the idea of a corporation as a person is actually a good thing. If we think of it in terms of the language that Father Massaro uses, we are one body in Christ, and we need to learn to literally let our barriers down in that sense. If we can do that, if we can at the bare minimum share a genuine and physical sign of peace, for example, with those around us during Mass, it seems possible that we could transfer that sense of solidarity into a way of life that helps us to stand with others rather than away from them. And he points out that the Eucharist is not only a satiation of spiritual hunger, that it also brings to mind the urgency of the physically hungry, the poor who lack access to food on a daily basis. The Eucharist, he reminds us, points to a countercultural way of life, an inclusive fellowship described in the Gospels that often accompanies feasts, banquets, and even the simplest of meals. And not to trivialize the topic, but just think about this conference. When does the fellowship part truly or often mostly take place? Over food and drink, right? Um, food is not only nourishment. It's a time, it's a reason to gather, to talk, and often it's home. 
Finally, Father Massaro indicates at one point that the Eucharist challenges the status quo. If we remember that, we can't help but be moved by the spirit of social justice that, as he shows us, permeates this sacrament, even if implicitly. But back to the Vatican II document itself. After hearing Father Massaro's interpretation of some of the significant aspects of the liturgy, we see why he would find great meaning in certain phrases from Sacrosanctum Concilium. He mentions liturgy as the, quote, source and summit of the life of the church and the, quote, active participation of lay, member, lay members in liturgical celebrations. And he acknowledges in his talk that he's trying to reveal a unity in things that were previously artificially separated, most notably liturgy and ethics. So it's appropriate and kind of ironic that I've been given the honor of responding to him today since he was a mentor to me during my years as a doctoral student in theological ethics when I was wrestling with apparent discontinuities like these. I'm grateful for this opportunity to learn more from him and I look forward to hearing some of your comments and questions about the observations he's made on this document and beyond the more well-known and obvious details like the actual liturgical changes it brought about in parishes worldwide. So some of the questions I would have include, if how we pray and worship is linked to how we live, if the liturgy and the Eucharist in particular are connected to our actions in the world, and this connection is made through an indirect means, how is that connection manifested? Where can we see it? Can we see it? Or is it something that's so subtle, at least at this point, that it's a, like a gentle but strong flame that needs to be fanned by the faithful in order to be made visible? He mentions uh, Sister Scott and her example of this, but where else can it be found? I believe it can. Uh, another question I have would be, how do we overcome the issue of separation during the liturgy itself? And here, Sacrosanctum Concilium makes great strides in addressing the physical divide between the clergy and the laity. But what about this individualistic need for personal space between the people in the pews? How can we be in solidarity with others around the world if we can't stand together with our fellow parishioners? if we're fearful of too much closeness during the sign of peace. I'm sure you'll have other questions, comments, um, and I will leave it to you to either discuss the ones I've just brought up or whatever else you might like to explore. Thank you and thank you to Father Massaro. I'm delighted with the topic of social justice in the liturgy because I think the reality in our Ameri U.S. world today and in our, the, the area in which we live politically, the rest of it, there are a lot of Catholics who are very public Catholics. And they have totally opposing, polarized views on responses to social justice. You know, I always want to put Representative King from Iowa and the nuns in the bus in the same church with, you know, Ryan and the vice president, you know, and just, just watch, you know, what happens with that. And, and for some people, in reality, when they look at, well, so what does it mean to be Catholic, or what does it mean to be people of a common prayer with liturgy or whatever, and it's kind of a scandal and it's a contradiction and a paradox. So I'd just like you to, to speak to what's the gift that maybe we need to look for and add, or the role uh, of the positive power of liturgy in that reality because those people, uh, I would say our people, I would give them, all of them, the, the gift of goodwill, good intention, you know. And yet, uh, there, there, there can be real scandal. What, what can the daily or the weekly or the, the reality of prayer together, liturgy together, Eucharist, how do we speak to the gift that that is in face of that reality? Wonderful question. It's, uh, it reminds me of some things that, uh, experiences I had. I lived in Washington for about three years, on and off in the 90s mostly, and uh, uh, there were parishes on Capitol Hill 
where Democratic senators and Republican senators worship together on a Sunday. And before the 90s, I always used to say, well, how could you, after praying with somebody, how could you possibly disagree with them? <laughs> well, they found ways to be disagreeing. We live in a country, and most of my work is really in political and economic ethics, more so than certainly in liturgy or sacraments. So I think about these questions all the time. The participation of Catholics in public life. That was one of the topics I spoke on uh, here at Creighton some years ago. Um, when you're in a, a liturgy, especially on a Sunday at a random parish, city, countryside, suburbs, you will be seated in a congregation that has roughly equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats. The Catholic population mirrors the general population of the United States on party affiliation and on voting. Presidential election after presidential election. Catholics are the swing vote because we're about 50-50, and whichever way we break as a quarter of the population will likely lead to the election. So the, the idea that you bring up that there are people in the congregation who have different opinions from you, and there are Catholics in public life some of whom will agree with you on some issues and not on others. And uh, it reminds me of something that John Carr said. Anybody know who John Carr, the, for 25 years, he was the bishop's director of the United States Co Conference of Catholic Bishops for social, and domestic, uh, social, domestic policy, and international justice as well. John Carr said, Catholics, in a sense, are homeless in American politics. There is no party, Democratic or Republican, which mirrors all the full range of concerns of the Catholic Church on social issues today. So the obvious question, questions of abortion, questions of resort to warfare, questions of social justice and sharing of the wealth and tax policy. Let's just assume that no major political party in the United States is ever going to perfectly match the bundle of values, social justice and peace values, and, and pro-life values that the Catholic Church uh, stands for. So we're all a little schizophrenic, and we're all looking for some combination of, um, of, uh, of positions that do not perfectly match ours. That's how I feel uh, personally anyway. So the gift, you, you asked the question, what is the gift that we're looking for? Uh, I think the gift, it's got to be a little more than simply toleration. A lot of people are satisfied with that Let's just tolerate a lot of people. Big church, you know, big tent mentality. I think it's got to be what my colleague at Boston College, David Hollenbach, calls intellectual solidarity. So even though we don't agree with every single person, and some, some people, you know, they're Catholics, but there are different stripes of Catholics. They have to choose among hard values, among conflicting values in public life. I think we need to enter into intellectual solidarity with even those who disagree with us, even those who attend our liturgies and walk out the door and have a different sense of our values. Um, a consistent ethic of life would be one, of the, one, ways of, one way of putting this. And to care enough to stay in dialogue and not to shut off the dialogue. It's so easy to write people off. Oh, he doesn't, he doesn't see uh, the abortion issue the way I do, therefore I'm not going to engage him. So that's my hope. My hope is that liturgy is a place not for division but for increasing unification. But I'm not so naive as to think we're all going to walk out that door and act perfectly on all the scales of values, but that we will remain in dialogue even more urgently so because we have just prayed that we share a place around the Eucharistic table. Thank you for a very perceptive question. I wish I had an easy answer. It's a complex answer, but it's an answer that points us to the, into the future, a future that will demand things of us, hard work, but those things are worth striving for. What do you think about this? It seems that the new general instruction of the Roman Catholic liturgy is withdrawing more from the involvement beyond the liturgy. Say things like the priest's not supposed to come out of the altar to, for the greeting of peace. Say the prayers you have uh, over the gifts, with well, the opening prayer over the gifts and after communion, they all seem to be about help us get to heaven. And when you talk about love, it seems to be more related to that community. Or the Our Father, when we used to hold hands and, and feel one with one another. It seems like there's a drift away from that social dimension of connection at the Mass, and the liturgy does not seem to point us as explicitly out 
except that the dismissal prayer, love and serve God and your neighbor. Do you think that that recent translation is really being true to the original uh, intent of the document on the liturgies? Good, thank you. Um, your, your question, Father Hauser, is a, is a learned one, and it, it calls forth a lot of responses from a theologian. We're always conscious of gaps or potential gaps between instructions of the church and how they're enacted. There's always, in my mind, to my thinking, a theologian is always looking for um, what we call in theology, in moral theology, epikaia, the, the careful and, and judicious adjustment through the use of prudence of general norms, like the general instruction of the Roman Missal, to Father Hauser's question, refer to the germ uh, as abbreviation for it, uh, to uh, parish situations, local situations. Uh, I like holding hands at the Our Father, and until somebody tells me I have to stop, I'm gonna keep doing it, um, and, and, and inviting people to do it. Um, so there are pastoral applications that make it real. I am also concerned about the language of the liturgy being a little bit off-putting. Uh, you know, I have jaw-breaking experiences some Sundays at those liturgies, trying to chart those, uh, diagram the sentences that I'm asked to pray. Uh, it doesn't always feel like prayer. We could quibble with the lectionary, with, with the sacramentary, the new translations. They are certainly awkward. Even their, even their defenders admit that there's some awkwardness there. Uh, to make them better would be an improvement. The deeper question you ask, though, is fascinating to me. And it's about that distinction between an, what I always call an inner-worldly spirituality and an otherworldly spirituality. That is a tension that has been uh, with, I'll speak for Catholic social teaching documents, the, the documents of the church that I know best, the social encyclicals. That has been with the body of literature that we theologians study, church documents, for a long time. I don't think there's ever gonna be an easy resolution. It's a both and answer, by the way, and that's the best of our tradition. We are pilgrims. We do have our eyes on the ultimate horizon, the end of time, life with God in, in the kingdom. But at the same time, the other eye has to be on the road and on the here and now and on the details. Any good pilgrim tries to avoid tripping on stones along the path. We're a little bit schizophrenic. One eye on the present, inner-worldly, caring for the poor, the bodily needs of people, that's a social justice agenda, but the other eye on long-term, spiritual well-being of people. Ultimately, I don't think that they are conflictual. I do agree, however, that liturgy, when it's not done well, may not combine the two so well. One of the great ways of combining the two is with, you mentioned the dismissal at the end of Mass. Isn't it kind of an afterthought? You've, rece you've received communion, you've been wowed with a great homily and a great... Uh, a liturgy of the Eucharist and all the wonderful things, and then some guy mumbles, "Let's go, go and go in peace, love and serve the Lord." Or uh, go. You know, I actually like the new uh, the new option that we have: go and glorify the Lord with your life. That's a wonderful thing. I would actually like to extend the uh, the dismissal at the end of Mass. It used to just be uh, "ita missa est," right? That was just three Latin words. I would like to extend it and get people to think consciously of what it is they're doing as they're leaving the church, as they're going outdoors to love and to serve the Lord and one another in new and creative ways. I suppose we're not gonna add any more sentences to the end of mass anytime soon. Maybe it's up to those of us who preach, uh, preach regularly, to make the homily, the sermon, something that consciously, more consciously than, than before, sends people forth and links their life in the church, in liturgy, to moments outside. So that's one of the ways that, that I think of where that happens. Your agenda, though, of linking the innerworldly, the otherworldly, of, of keeping people um, conscious of what happens in the liturgy, sacred acts, and more secular acts outside the church doors is a wonderful agenda that I think this conference is helping us to do in a more conscious way. I'd like to push back a little bit uh, in, in one thing that you said, uh, the, the maxim uh, liturgy is not about information, it's about formation. And I understand that and, and, and I agree with it and I get the point. But uh, I, I certainly, it, it, in assenting to that, I, I want to take a stand for uh, the kind of teaching I think that the, the occasion requires. This is the one time in the week for many people 
that they get together and think about their faith as they celebrate it. And isn't there a place in the service of the word to share the vision, say, of Catholic social teaching? Um, that is really teaching, but it's, it's teaching in, a, in, a, in the context of uh, celebration and affirmation. Um, it, that certainly has been a big part of my motive as, as a preacher. Uh, I think I hardly ever give a sermon that doesn't touch somehow on Catholic social teaching because it is such a big part of our faith. And let's say in the, in the season of elections and so on, even though uh, we're very attentive to the fact that we're not supposed to be partisan, don't say vote for so-and-so, uh, yet we know that in um, our documents about faithful citizenship, there's something there to challenge people on either side of the aisle, uh, all of us, you know, uh, and, and it comes right out of the teaching of Jesus. So can't we also face the fact that formation always involves maybe not so much information, but teaching, which we hope is informative. Uh, so do, do you want to comment on that a little bit? I'd be delighted to comment, and especially a response to Father Dennis Ham, who's instructed many people over many years about the very task of preaching justice. And I still continue to use in my courses uh, an article he wrote in which little segments of four of his sermons on social justice were included. I'll give you the reference to that if I can think of it. Um, the short answer to his question is, the problem is that the mass bears too much weight Catholics should be showing up at church or at the parish or at the local assembly hall more often during the week than just that one hour on Sunday. In fact, I love the, the way that our, mostly our Protestant um, and certainly evangelical uh, uh, friends show up many times for uh, Wednesday nights, a typical night for Methodists to go down to the church, and I know Baptists do also, and have some lessons, have some adult catechesis, adult education. If we did that, Mass wouldn't be so overloaded. The homily wouldn't have to fill the didactic purpose as well as the other purposes. Uh, well, I give homilies, I take pride in my homilies, I spend a lot of time preparing them. I always hope that they do three things, or at least one of these three things on any given week. One is to share my faith with other people, hopefully not too self-referential, but I'm the only person I really know that well, so I try to share my faith and inspire others to make the parallels to their faith. Secondly, didactic. There are homilies where I do, and I know uh, colleagues of mine, uh, people who share homily notes before and after their homilies in the Jesuit community, do some teaching. And it's, again, it's a teachable moment. That is when the people are gathered. I wish there were other times during the week. We wouldn't have to, 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 to use some of our homily time to teach basic doctrines of the church. Um, and then the third thing I hope homilies do, I hope everyone's homily does, and I know the Father Ham's homilies do this, because I have examples of them in print, is to move people to action. And that's the link of, of uh, liturgy and justice, social justice, activism, social ministry, that I tried to make in my talk just now, and that is obvious to all of us. Think of the best homilies that you have heard. Did they not move you to action, to do something a little differently afterwards, than the way that you did, you lived and acted. It gave you some new commitments from what you had before you walked into the church that Sunday. So yes, the short answer is it's lamentable that that's the only time that Catholics gather in the course of a typical week in a typical parish. Would that we could change it and have instruction time that's a little different from the homily time. And uh, boy, if I knew of a way to, to get people into church on Wednesday night, could, can we give away free pizzas? That, that would get me. Free pizza would get me to go. I would give up my Wednesday evening viewing of uh, sports events or something uh, if we could do that. A laudable goal. And I think that the vitality of all of our parishes, of all of our worshiping communities, uh, really would be increased if we had other times of communal prayer and study and learning together besides the Mass. Thanks so much for your talk, Father. Um, at our table, we were discussing how very easy it is to sit far apart from the other Christian faithful at Mass if you're sitting in a particularly empty church. Um, and I guess my question for you is, how do you feel that the council documents 
provide an opportunity for us under the new evangelization. Good. I knew that the most uh, specific part of my talk would be the one that people wound up chatting about, and that's good, the, uh, the, the tendency to sit so far apart. But it's, it's not just that one uh, lamentable characteristic uh, flaw that we have sitting apart from others. It's, I think it's symbolic, and I think your question suggested this, it's symbolic of a larger, maybe a, a, a aporia, a, a, a lacuna, a, a lack of our communal felt. Do you really know the people in your parish on a Sunday? I don't, I mean, uh, I haven't had, you don't get a chance to meet them. People aren't forthcoming enough. So it does, it, it's emblematic. It's st the, the fact that we sit apart from each other stands for a larger reality, a lack of the vitality uh, and the closeness, close-knit nature of our parish life. And I've lived in big cities all my life, so maybe the anonymity of the big city uh, is part of that problem. So really, when I think about the role of the documents of Vatican II, or really any church documents, most of the time, they are what uh, John Courtney Murray, the great Jesuit uh, social ethicist, uh, sometimes called a skeleton law. They're just the bare bones. If you go through Sacrosanctum Concilium, I listed some of the almost silly things. Uh, they tried to micromanage a few things. But most of the time, most church documents are very general. I would say vague as a critical uh, way of putting that, but I would actually put it in a positive way. They don't attempt to over-specify what should not be specified. Think about it. You're a, you're a member of a church council, you're a council father, or you're a pope, or you're anything. You're sitting in Rome and you're writing documents for a one billion Catholics in about 170 different countries, each of which has its own culture, and many countries have multiple cultures within their boundaries. How could any sentence, any liturgical regulation, any social justice, um, enactment really be appropriate to be applied in all those diverse situations. In a document from 1971 called Octogesima Adveniens, Pope, jo Pope Paul VI said, in the face of such widely varying conditions, it is difficult for us, he was using the royal plural here, us, the king, queen, uh, to utter a, a, a word that is uh, applicable to all circumstances. It is up to the local Christian communities, I'm paraphrasing now, up to the local Christian communities, meaning dioceses, parishes, probably national levels too, to apply these to their own situation. Yes, there are things that are valid universally, that are helpful to people around the world, but there are also things that should not be over-specified, micromanaged, uh, in other ways. So, you know, I think that's a very helpful reminder of how to use a Vatican II document. We're not fundamentalists, we're not literalists. Some people use the Bible as their fundamentalism. Some people use church documents in a fundamentalistic way. That's not the style in which they're intended. They're intended to be, again, I'll go back to that phrase, skeleton law, the bare bones in which your practice should fit in, in a, in a you know, accommodated way, a reconcilable way, but not uh, the, the letter of the law or not an overly specified thing. I mean, we're, we're all called to follow Jesus, to be disciples, but we don't take that in such a literal way that we restrict our, shoe, our footwear to sandals, right? Uh, we do things that Jesus did, and remember he said at the end of the Good Samaritan, go and do likewise, okay? And you can interpret the Greek behind that in different ways, but the sense is don't do exactly the same. I mean, don't wait on the Jerusalem Jericho Road for a guy to be uh, kidnapped. Find other ways to be helpful to people where you are. No need to go to the Jerusalem Jericho Road. Didn't Mother Teresa say, go find your own Calcutta? You don't all have to come to the same place that I've been at if you want to imitate me. Uh, so let's find our own ways of being faithful to the documents with a sense of creativity and applicability to apply these to our own situations. Thank you for that excellent question. I stay true to my reputation. I'll carry on much longer than I'm supposed to. Um, retired priest, Hop Houghton Parishes. The buzz in the local Catholic metro area, and this might be too close to home, um, and then keeping in mind what I just said, and then the Zacchaeus gospel we just had about Zacchaeus providing a welcome place 
for the Lord, I tried to bring that to connect to the local situation where the Creighton Hospital future is in question. According to the local newspaper, I understand the board, the big board met this week. I don't know the details, but the National Catholic, what is it, Hospital Association? What's it called? Okay. Uh, the talk is that Creighton is outdated, the facility, and so, plus too many beds in Omaha. So another hospital in the system would like, I think, to expand and absorb in their physical plant, you know, a lot of the facility and the offerings that Creighton Hospital now provides. Anyway, it's among the lay people, this is a hot topic right now. And in the staff of the hospital, where I go for therapy three times a week, and where I see doctors from time to time. I saw one of my doctors uh, a week ago. I, he walks in the exam room. He says, Father Don, how are you doing? I says, fine. I says, how are you? He said, I don't know. I don't know where the future is going. And he was disturbed. And I've heard from so many staff people in the hospital that they are so concerned about their future. It's very cloudy and it's up for grabs, up for grabs literally. The bigger question perhaps is Creighton has a reputation for answering the needs of the poorer population in Northeast Omaha, for example. If the facility is moved, uh, social justice-minded people wonder what's going to happen. I just stopped in the foyer of the hospital as I was going to the valet parking yesterday, and I saw again the mission statement. We're here dedicated especially to the poor and whatever. Another side question, which really is impertinent, is the Jesuit connection. As the system of hospitals in the nation has absorbed the ownership and the decision making, I don't know what if the Jesuits have much to say anymore. I would think that they would want to have meetings around the city talking about what's happening because there's a lot of hurt already. In a recent homily I referred to, uh, the nun came up to me, she's the uh, so a ministry of uh, liturgy after mass, she was disturbed with me because a woman who works at Creighton was very upset at the homily. I guess maybe I got too specific, I don't know, but I thought the people should be made aware of this situation, which they're not being given a chance, the ordinary people of the area. So sister was criticizing me because this woman came down on her uh, for this priest who caused her to feel hurt and anger which she already felt, but I just allowed it to surface. At another mass in the same place, the deacon came to me and said, Father, I forgot to tell you, this old man came up to me in tears, and he wanted me to tell you he appreciated your homily so much because it moved him so much. So I guess in my life, I don't know how to preach anymore. I guess I expect a full gamut of reaction because the people come from all sorts of backgrounds, have all sorts of philosophical and moral issues. So what do I do? I wish I had an easy question, an easy answer to that. Very heartfelt question, and thank you for it, Father. Um, as a moral theologian, I can just, I'll just say a few basic things just to contextualize this. I don't know anything about the city of Omaha, despite my desire to become its mayor. Uh, I'll have to wait till after I, my election before I address these issues. This is happening all over the country, and let me tell you how moral theologians think about this. 
Catholic, the Catholic community, again, in this country, started very small as a uh, group of immigrants, and we had high boundaries. We knew who we were, we ghetto Catholicism. And as we become successful, uh, spread out throughout the country, and not just immigrant communities on the East Coast, but uh, I can see here in Omaha, we've become the founder of some major institutions. Here we are, Creighton University. We, because of our success, we have new problems that we never had before. Our institutions, universities, healthcare systems, hospitals, as you mentioned, uh, many other institutions that we have, have suddenly gone mainstream. We don't really control them the way we used to. The Jesuit, we have 28 colleges in this country. We don't really control them as the Society of Jesus, separate incorporation, lay boards, majority of our employees are generally not Catholics anymore. The university that I'm a part of, Santa Clara University, is going through a very difficult time of sorting out with the Affordable Health Care Act, how we can, there are mandates about contraception, and you know the, the issues, how we can live out the gospel in an institution that we don't really control anymore. And again, most of our employees are not members of our faith community. And by the way, even if they were, <laughs> the Catholic opinions on contraception and, and sadly abortion aren't that much different than the general population. How do you run a school and a hospital or other big institutions under these circumstances? The, con the constraints are not just opinions of our employees. The constraints are legal abiding by federal guidelines, maybe you have state guidelines here in Nebraska, uh, that force us to do things we would rather not do. So just to say the obvious, it's important to maintain Catholic identity as much as we can, but not to play that card so hard that we no longer serve people who are Jewish and Protestant and Buddhist and Islamic. How do we respect their beliefs? Maybe they embrace contraception or elective abortion, but we don't. I think it's important for us to send a signal of what we stand for, but also at the same time, as we send that signal, to make our stewardship over institutions as uh, accommodating, as welcoming, tolerant of other people's beliefs as we can. Otherwise, we would restrict, first we would lose all federal funding, we would restrict our universities, our student body, and our, and our faculty and our employees to only Catholics, and then we're back to the 1880s ghetto Catholicism. How you combine those two, how you deal with the hurts and the pain that are involved with mergers of healthcare systems, the, the directives for Catholic involvement in um, Moral theologians call this cooperation with evil. That there's remote and there's proximate cooperation with evil. I believe we will be forced legally to do some things that are against our will and even our doctrines. I still believe, however, that we have the ability to send the signal of what our moral backbone is. What are the things that, what are the values that we are committed to? What are the principles that we're willing to stand up for? Even though we're not able to live them out the way we could have a hundred years ago or more, even more recently. So I'm not surprised to hear about the pain. I don't know the details here in Omaha. I don't really uh, do healthcare ethics uh, on a regular basis. So hospitals, though, are the front lines of these conflicts. I hope that we can keep our sense of Catholic identity really standing for something with a backbone, but at the same time, run our institutions with a sensitivity to the constraints of law and to the diverse uh, constituencies that count on us in our large institutions. If it was easy, somebody would have found an answer a long time ago. <laughs>